Before we get into my big board for the 2021 NFL Draft, I will say I will be streaming the first round of the draft on this very YouTube channel tomorrow night on the 29th, night one of the NFL Draft. So make sure you're subscribed so you can watch that live stream. Scroll down, takes a second, hit that subscribe button if you're not subscribed already. And I will be streaming day two and day three of the NFL Draft on my Twitch channel. The link is in the description. It's twitch.tv slash bangle. I will be live for day two and three. It's also important to note that this is not a mock draft. So just because I have Kyle Pitts as the number two overall player in the draft does not mean I think Kyle Pitts is going at number two overall. A lot of you guys don't know the difference between a big board and a mock draft. This is not a mock draft. This is a player rankings based on the player overall in the grand scheme of things. I will also say that this is a very, very strong class and a very deep class at that. So it is fairly difficult, in my opinion, to differentiate the number 100 overall player in the draft and a guy like maybe number 70. It's very, very close. And when you're talking about, oh, this cornerback is better than this halfback, how do you compare those two positions? It's just how I feel about these guys overall. Some players have dropped due to injury concerns because I do have to factor that in about how good they could become long term. Speaking of how good they could become long term, you got to really factor in how you feel about the player overall. Maybe that means that you think a player could become special, but maybe he's not that player right now. So maybe you boost him up ahead of a player who's a little bit better. But maybe you think two players are comparable. One has the higher ceiling, meaning they could become better long term. So maybe they're a little bit higher. Maybe a player is better right now, but maybe they won't ever get that much better. But maybe you like that ahead of a guy with some big questions. Maybe they're a great athlete, but they're not really that technically solid. They're not very nuanced as a player. Maybe they're a pass rusher with no pass rush plan or pass rush moves. Maybe they're lower than a guy that isn't a great athlete, but does have the technical side down. So assembling a big board is fairly difficult because you're ranking based on so many different things but i will talk to you guys i will scroll down talk about some of these guys and then we're going to go over position by position i ranked over or i ranked 200 players i watched over 200 players this year and it was it was a lot uh for some of these guys like maybe a justin fields who's deemed to be the top quarterback or one of the top quarterbacks in the class i should say i watched more of him than a guy like ian book out of notre dame even though i've seen notre dame play you know a hundred times right Justin Fields, I had to watch, you know, eight to 10 games to really see what type of player he was versus Ian Book, where maybe I watched three or four. And I'm like, I have a pretty good idea of who he is as a player. But yeah, uh, I think those are the kind of fundamental ideas of a big board and how I did this ranking uh, and some of the just the background on this list out of the way. The last thing I will say is, yeah, you're not going to like the list. It, it, it was tough to assemble, but I'm going with my gut and how I feel about the players rather than what you've seen out there from other guys or maybe how you even individually feel about these players yourself. I'm going with my gut. That's what I have to trust at the end of the day. And I'm going to be wrong about a lot of these guys. The draft is an inexact science. A player could be great on tape and then not great three years from now. Or, or a player could not be that great and then through coaching, development, and experience, could become a fantastic player. Josh Allen's one of those great examples where he was not very good at Wyoming. No accuracy. Wasn't really good his first or second year in the league, and then last year played like an MVP. These players do develop. It's tough to predict, but that's you know part of the fun, part of the challenge. And uh, who doesn't love being called an idiot by guys that definitely know better than me in the YouTube comments section? But uh, let's go ahead and talk about the top 10. So Trevor Lawrence, I think, is the clear-cut best player in the draft. I don't think it's by a mile. I don't think it's by a mile. But Trevor Lawrence is just a really, really good quarterback. We've talked about him you know, so much on this channel. But uh, he's got the mobility that you'd look for at the quarterback position. He's got the arm. Doesn't have the strongest arm in the draft. Maybe doesn't even have the most accurate arm in the draft. Maybe he's not even the best overall decision maker and the best at reading defenses. But overall, when you talk about an athletic profile with the size, with the decent mental processing, with the pretty good accuracy, with one of the best deep balls in the draft. Trevor Lawrence is just the complete package and does everything really well. Even if he's a jack-of-all-trades type guy, that's not bad at the quarterback position. Trevor Lawrence really can do it all. Kyle Pitts, we talked about him all year, versatile weapon. I think he's the number two overall player in the draft. He just has this rare blend of size, speed, and technical ability as a route runner that it's really, really tough to match up against him. So he can do so many things really well. I think he's the second best player in the draft. Zach Wilson is number three for me. Talked about him. I made an individual video on Zach Wilson months ago, and it seems like everyone else hopped on the train 
finally when they got to watching Zach Wilson. I thought he was a stud at BYU, at least this last season. And I, I think that's going to translate in the NFL, especially if he gets coached up by Robert Sala and the hopeful better Jets coaching staff with uh, with the new regime there in Sala. But I think Zach Wilson's a really good player. He's projected to go to the Jets. Jalen Waddle at number four. I think he's the best receiver in the draft. I will not back down on this. It is my feeling. I think Jalen Waddle is up there as one of the best route runners. I think it's him. And I think it's Devontae Smith. They're very close in terms of route running ability. What puts Jalen Waddle ahead for me? I think he's just another jack-of-all-trades type guy where he plays bigger than his size. He can go up and high point the football, and he's also going to run by you. He's the fastest receiver in the class that runs the best routes and has the best hands. I think Jalen Waddle is just the pure blend of everything you want at wide receiver. Maybe he doesn't have the, the best hands in the entire draft, but when you talk about a player that is really, really good in a bunch of different areas, plus is dynamic about what he can do on the field as, you know, in, ter- in terms of just changing a game with his speed, Jalen Waddle is the best. But he's not hes not just a speed guy. I don't want to have that misconception there because he does everything really well and the speed takes it over the top. Justin Fields is the only change I've made for my quarterback rankings. He moved up just ahead of Trey Lance. I think they're very similar in terms of overall talent. But when I thought about floor versus ceiling and what that means again is where a guy is right now floor versus where they could be ceiling i was more comfortable putting justin fields one spot above trey lance because he is better right now he's arguably the most accurate quarterback in the class and trey lance could be a stud he's my number six player in the entire draft i think very highly of trey lance but he is a little bit more raw is a little bit more inconsistent the accuracy is not quite as good but I, I love Trey Lance as a player. I just decided Justin Fields is probably a little bit better day one, or maybe a lot better day one, even if Trey Lance could be better long term. I just felt safer about Justin Fields one spot up above Trey Lance. They're very comparable. Jamar Chase at number seven. Love Jamar Chase. Extremely physical. He has arguably the best hands in the entire class. He is physical at the catch point. Love Jamar Chase. Jalen Phillips, I think, is the best defensive player in the class. He's flying off the edge. He's a tremendous athlete, and he's very, very fundamentally and technically sound at the position. Has great rush counters, and he really has a pass rush plan. And it's a tough, tough task for any offensive tackle to block him off the edge because no tackle seemingly for a full game can handle the speed and the power and the technical ability of Jalen Phillips. He has a really good idea about where to use his hands. He understands leverage really well. He's got really good pop in his hands as well. Love Jalen Phillips. The only reason he is not considered to be one of the top players in the class by a lot of guys is because of his concussion issues, and he was forced to retire. But then you find out UCLA has a rule that forces you to retire after three concussions. Jalen Phillips was fine at Miami. So he didn't retire really by choice. He was forced to, and then we found out or found out he could transfer and still play. He was a dominant player. I think Jalen Phillips is incredible and my number one defensive player in the draft for a reason. Rashawn Slater and Panay Sewell I have right next to each other. I think they're very, very good. And it's just another situation like Justin Fields and Trey Lance, where I think Slater is the better player right now, even if Panay Sewell could be the better player in two or three or four or five years. I think Rashawn Slater is the better player right now, more technically sound. Panay Sewell is a guy that doesn't really have a great idea how to play the position from a fundamental standpoint. He gets off balance. He leans into guys. He gets his upper half over his lower half sometimes. And Rashawn Slater just doesn't do that. This is a guy that played against Chase Young and shut Chase Young down, shut anyone on that Ohio State defensive line, which is a good defensive line. And a complex defense in some ways where you have to handle stunts and you have to handle twists and different things as an offensive lineman. Slater has versatility to play guard, maybe even center as well. I just think he's a little bit better right now than Panay Sewell. So Sewell, who's a great athlete and just a rare, rare, rare blend of size and speed at the position. I just think Sewell is a little bit more raw. So I I moved him down one spot. So now that you guys have a pretty good idea about you know, how these different player rankings go. We're going to go position by position just to make this a little bit more digestible. So I have Mac Jones at number 56 overall. That's going to be a little bit jarring to folks at first, I think. But Mac Jones to me is, you know, one of these floor guys. He's a guy that is going to be pretty good right now, but I don't think he's got this all world type arm or potential. I think he's a pretty good mover in the pocket. 
and he's fairly accurate, but he doesn't have the best deep ball at all. I think he shorts the deep ball. I don't want to say fairly regularly, but it certainly happens like more often than you'd like to see. And I think he played in a very, very easy offense for a quarterback. The throws in general were not particularly challenging. He's running a lot of screens. He's running a lot of short throws, and he's relying on great playmakers to go and make great plays. Devontae Smith, Jalen Waddell. I mean, uh, John Mechie. They have so many different playmakers at Bama at the receiver position. Then you have Najee Harris to contend with as well, and defenses have to bring in seven-man boxes minimum to stop him. If that, you bring eight-man fronts to try and stop Najee Harris, it opens up a ton. So I think Mac Jones had an easier job than a lot of these different quarterbacks. And I have to move him down. I don't think he's the best athlete. I don't think he has the best arm. I think he's going to be a good player. But I can't bring him into the first round as a first round talent. I just think in a strong, strong, strong draft class, I don't rate him all that highly. Kellen Mond at 71. I like Kellen Mond. I think he's a guy with more potential than Mac Jones because he does have the bigger arm. He does have the ability to improvise like Mac Jones I really don't think does. But Kellen Mond is also raw. We haven't seen him play nearly as well as Mac Jones. So I do have him lower, but I think he could be a a better player long term. But you're saying could be. If we live in a world of of shoulds and woulds and coulds, you're going to be in a really, really tough spot to figure out what's going on because some of these guys that should won't. Some of the guys that could will not. So if we're saying, oh, this player could be this, they might not ever be that. So I've decided to go with a safer player in Mac Jones. Uh, but I also respect that he doesn't have this all-world upside, in my opinion. So he is lower than these top guys, who I think could be, you know, top seven to ten quarterbacks in the NFL very easily in in you know five years. Davis Mills at 86. He's another guy like the light version of Mac Jones, in my opinion, where he's not this great improviser, doesn't have the biggest arm, but he anticipates pretty well. He's smart with the football. I like Davis Mills. I think he's a day one, you know, decent backup and eventual potential starter. Jamie Newman at 137 going way down the board a little bit. Jamie Newman's another good athlete with a strong arm and a good deep ball, but he played in a weird offense at Wake Forest. and he's listed at Georgia. He never played a snap there. Uh, Jamie Newman for Wake was in an RPO heavy offense where, yeah, he's making reads, but the defenses a lot of the time were not exactly aware of how to defend some of these RPOs and it made some of the throws easier and Jamie Newman's also handing the football off a lot and running QB power and you know QB leads and it was kind of a a weird offense so Jamie Newman was a tough eval but he's a little bit disappointing he's very inconsistent but again in the right system with the right coaching staff Jamie Newman I think could be a solid starter long term Kyle Trask at 160 a lot of guys are really high on Kyle Trask. He does make my top 200. There is no Shane Buchel on here. There's no Sam Ellinger. There's no Ian Book. So Kyle Trask, I do think highly of enough to put him in my top 200 players overall. But he's another guy like Mac Jones and Davis Mills where he's not the best athlete in the world and doesn't have the craziest arm talent. But he is fairly accurate in general. And he's smart with the football a lot of the time. Sometimes I wonder what he's doing. And that's why he's a little bit lower because he is inconsistent with decision making at times if whether people want to admit it or not he does miss things on the field even when it's in the progression and he does force the ball to not even kyle pitts but trayvon grimes and Kadarius tony at times he's gotten receivers killed with some bad ball placement over the middle but i think kyle trask could be a decent player i think he's a developmental quarterback who is a solid backup right away at running back i have a lot of them inside the top 200 i have a lot of them And the top three, I think, are all fairly close. In my running back ranking video, I called them 1A, 1B, and 1C. And I think Javante Williams has the potential to be the best of all of them in the top three, maybe. And I've talked a ton about Michael Carter. Michael Carter is a top 50 player for me. I know a lot of different guys do not have Michael Carter near the top 50. I'm a massive fan, and I will go to the bat for it. I'm not a huge running back guy in general. I think Michael Carter is a stud. Talk about ball carrier vision and overall elusiveness. Michael Carter is a really, really tough back to bring down because he will make you miss in space and he does find a way to get these extra yardage even if he's not this huge home run threat every time he touches the ball. I do have it Najee Harris, Travis Etienne, Javante Williams. It's all very close. Trey Sermon is a huge drop-off from Michael Carter, 
But I think Trey Sermon is a fairly good player. I like Trey Sermon a lot. I appreciate his contact balance up there with Javante Williams and Najee Harris. I think Trey Sermon is really, really good, except I don't think he's at all dynamic. I don't think he's a guy that's going to be a big threat to catch the football out of the backfield, or at least he wasn't that guy at Ohio State. And he's not a guy that's a home run hitter like a Travis Etienne. He's not a guy that's going to take it to the house. So Trey Sermon to me is like a Najee Harris type player that's slower and can't catch as well as Najee Harris. So he moves down a lot. But I like Trey Sermon as a player. Just outside my top 100, I have Kenneth Gainwell. And Gainwell's a tough one because I like what he could be. In the same way that I like Antonio Gibson coming out of Memphis, I like what he could be, where he's a guy that's like almost a hybrid slot receiver, and he is a receiver out of the backfield. He's not really the stud running back, in my opinion, but he's a stud versatile guy that can do a lot for you. And we're just going to have to see it. I like Kenneth Gainwell, but he didn't show up enough frequently for me. And you can point to like he had a 200 plus yard rushing game. And sometimes he would do that against bad competition. But I don't think he's his bell cow running back. I think he's a guy that rotates in. And it could be a really good third down option for you. But I'm not really sold on him as a starting running back in the NFL just yet. I'd love to, I'm not, I, I wouldn't love to be wrong because I think Kenneth Gainwell could be really good. But I'm just not sold on what I saw on tape at Memphis. Khalil Herbert at 135 going down you know, 30 or so spots. I like Herbert. I mean, I like a lot of these guys. I talked about a lot of these guys more on my running back video. You can go watch that if you want more in-depth breakdown. My rankings have not changed. I still like Chuba as a guy that, again, not going to offer you a lot as a receiver or as a pass blocker even, but as a pure runner, Chuba Hubbard's pretty good. Maybe can be a first and second down guy for you. Jamar Jefferson has some crazy ability in the open field and was a home run hitter at Oregon State. I don't think that speed's going to quite play the same way it did at Oregon State. JV and Hawkins is another guy that's incredible in space and is, you know, lightning in a bottle. This is a guy who's super explosive and super, super quick, shifty, and fast. JV and Hawkins in the right system could be very, very effective as this guy that can catch out of the backfield and, and can be like a little third down stud. But he's not going to be this guy that takes a ton of handoffs on first and second down and he's not going to be a three down running back for you so he has to move down a lot Ramondre Stevenson is kind of like the light version of Trey Sermon I think he offers you everything Trey Sermon does just a little bit less in every category Puka Williams is also pretty good and Chris Evans is a uh, solid athlete as well I wanted to include him in my top 200 even though he wasn't a guy that we saw in 2020 you know what that's right we saw him in um in 2020 a little bit we didn't see him in 2019 that's my bad on that but we will go to wide receiver. Receiver is a position where I had to rank a lot of guys because I think they're that good. I think there are a ton of receivers that belong being inside the top 200. These are the ones that I have. Some of these guys down at the bottom are just pure deep threats for me. Like Anthony Schwartz is a, a dude that could fly. But I don't really think he's a good like every down receiver. I don't think he excels that much at creating separation. Same thing with Josh Palmer, Frank Darby. Marquez Stevenson. I think these guys are deep threats. Even Tutu Atwell. Austin Watkins to a lesser degree. But I think these guys are deep threats. I don't think they're every down receivers. I think they could be a good, you know, fourth or fifth receiver on a team. And I think they're solid guys. And I wanted to rank them. Trayvon Grimes as well. A, a you know, deep threat jump ball receiver. But I don't think these guys are as good as some of the players I have above them. Josh Amater Bebe. I think he's a deep threat. I think he's a jump ball receiver. And I think his production could have been better at Illinois, but really bad quarterback play. I think another guy who kind of suffered from that was Seth Williams. Not great quarterback play. Bo Nix is terrible. Before that, Jarrett Sidham couldn't hit him. Seth Williams could be a really good player. He's a possession style, jump ball receiver. Not as much of a deep threat as some of these other guys. But I like Seth Williams. Jalen Darden is elite with the football in his hands, but I think he made himself look a little bit better than he could be because he was playing at North Texas. So it's, it's easier to stand out and be way faster and way more elusive when you're playing at North Texas. And I do have to factor that in. He's not a guy that was a, a, just a crazy separator because he was this great route runner. I think the level of competition does play into effect a little bit there. Uh, Shai Smith, another guy that could be a really good slot receiver in a strong slot receiver draft and suffered from poor quarterback play. Cornell Powell, I like as a really like high floor guy where I don't know how much better he's going to get. I think he's a, a solid route runner with reliable hands 
and does a good, shield, a good job to shield himself from corners when making catches. But he's not super dynamic. I don't think he's ever going to run by you. But Cornell Powell, I think, would be really, really solid even if he's never going to be elite. Demetric Felton, I wanted to include in my top 100. Played a lot of running back at UCLA. I think he's going to be a hybrid running back slot receiver in the NFL. And I like him as a route runner. We saw him at the Senior Bowl, and he ran routes really, really well. I think he's a guy that fits better as a receiver than a running back. And he hasn't been playing receiver for a long time at all. So if we're just talking about a guy who's only just learning the position how good could he be in three to five years i'm you know taking a shot at Dimitri felton here and i'm saying this is a guy who's going to be better than he showed at ucla because he's a high ceiling guy in my opinion amir smith marset is another do-it-all type player where he could line up in the slot he could line up on the outside he's a guy like amari rogers in my opinion i think they're very similar players where they're great slot separators or could be and they run like running backs I think Amir Smith-Marset is a guy who is uh, reminiscent of Debo Samuel in the same way that Amari Rogers is. And it, again, it's a really, really st- a strong slot receiver class. You talk about Kay Johnson, Amari Rogers, Amir Smith-Marset, Demetric Felton, Shai Smith, Jalen Darden, Daz Newsom, Tutu Atwell, maybe. He's kind of like, a, I like him as a boundary deep threat. I don't know if he has the frame to play slot receiver, but Anthony Schwartz could be a slot guy. I think Simi Fajoko could be a slot guy. Wap Fillier, I definitely like in the slot. There's a lot of slot receivers in this class. Rondell Moore is another one. This is a really, really tough grade because Rondell Moore, it is impossible not to fall in love with his potential. Rondell Moore is one of the freakiest movers I've ever seen, right up there with Kadarius Toney. The problem for me with Rondell Moore is is not only is he small, he plays small. He doesn't really go outside of his frame to catch the ball too often. And he has little hands. He drops the football a lot. He double catches a lot. There's a lot to love with Rondo Moore, but there's a lot to hate. So if you can get him in an offense where he's just your do-it-all type guy, where he's not this receiver only, Rondo Moore could be really, really good. But where does he rank as a pure receiver? It's tough to say. It's tough to say. I still want him near the top 50 in this draft class because I think he is a super dynamic player. But as a pure receiver, he's tough. He's tough, honestly. Big time potential. The hands are a big concern of mine. I like Cade Johnson a lot. I talked about him more in the receiver video. Really good slot separator. Really good hands. Really good body control. Can adjust to poorly thrown balls regularly. Love Cade Johnson. I love Dwayne Eskridge. Had to be a top 50 player in the draft for me. He's another guy like Rondo Moore that's super, super fast. Not the biggest receiver in the world. Probably going to be a slot receiver. But, I mean, he's a pretty good slot separator. He is a pretty good route runner. And he did have some drop concerns as well. But I think overall he was making tough catches look easy at times. And he's a better receiver than Rondo Moore is. So maybe you like Rondo Moore in space a little bit more. I think that's fine. I like Dwayne Eskridge as a pure receiver more. So I had to have him higher. Diami Brown is only one spot above Dwayne Eskridge. And they're completely different types of players. Diami Brown is a solid route runner but didn't run a complex route tree. Only ran a few different routes but was really, really effective on those routes. Works back to the football, maybe to a fault, maybe overworks back to the football sometimes, but overall has good hands and is a big-time deep threat. I like Diami Brown a lot. If he can pick up more routes and had more routes to his uh, his route tree and have more options after the stem, Diami Brown could be really, really good. Tylen Wallace is a guy I'm higher on than a lot of different guys are. I love Tylen Wallace. He's maybe not the most elite separator in the world. He's not the most explosive or the quickest guy, but overall is a solid route runner with phenomenal hands, great body control, great at the catch point, and great after the catch. I love Tylen Wallace as a player. I know I'm higher on him than a lot of different guys seem to be, but I think Tylen Wallace is going to be a really good receiver too in the NFL. Terrace Marshall moving up a few spots from Tylen Wallace. Big time jump ball receiver. Uh, Not the most explosive player in the world, but has really good hands in traffic especially. Had some concentration drops, but overall, I like Terrace Marshall Jr. a lot as a player. Pretty good deep speed as well. 
moving up significantly from Terrace Marshall. Two guys nearly back-to-back, Elijah Moore and Kadarius Toney. Kadarius Toney gets a slight edge because I think he can play on the outside. He's a little bit bigger. He's also an elite mover. Maybe isn't quite as fast as Elijah Moore, but I think is a little bit better with the ball in the air. Elijah Moore plays above his size, but I think Kadarius Toney does as well. Elijah Moore is only about 5'8", 5'9", but really, really, really good route runner. Explosive. Quick in and out of his breaks. Sharp cuts. I think he's great as a ball carrier as well. This is a guy that could take, you know, fly sweeps and even runs out of the backfield. I like Elijah Moore a lot. A lot, a lot, a lot. Another guy with not the biggest hands, but he had more reliable hands than Rondell Moore. I think Elijah Moore is a stud. Tony, again, talked about him a little bit. He's great through contact. Doesn't drop the ball. Love Kadarius, Tony. Rashad Bateman is not too far away from Devontae Smith. I love Rashad Bateman. Uh, He is not the most explosive guy in the world either, but he's a big-time player on the boundary. This is a guy who can be an outside receiver, can be a receiver one in the NFL. Another guy who's really not dropping the football very often. Great body control, great at the catch point. Love Rashad Bateman. Not great after the catch. Would love to see him be a little bit better through press. But Rashad Bateman overall, I think, is a stud. Devontae Smith at 13. It's not really a slight on Devontae Smith. It's a really, really strong class for me. And I think 13 is really good. Devontae Smith is one of the better receiver class or prospects we've seen in the past couple classes. I think he would have been receiver one in the last draft. Love Devontae Smith. The weight isn't really a huge concern to me. It's not because it's tough to jam up the line because his feet are so good. His hands are so good. I love Devontae Smith. I just think he falls to 13 because the players above him are just a little bit better. And he's not the fastest guy in the world. Jalen Waddell, I think, does everything Devontae Smith does, except he is a home run waiting to happen every time he touches the ball, where Devontae Smith is consistency and maybe not a big-time home run threat, even though he did have a ton of touchdowns last year. Jamar Chase, a bully with the ball in the air. Love Jamar Chase. He's explosive after the catch. It's tough between him and Jalen Waddell for the best receiver after the catch in the draft. Chase is the more physical. He's a guy that'll go through you for extra yards. Jalen Waddle will run by you and go around you. It's tough, man. They're very, very, very good receivers. I just like Waddle because I think he's more explosive and he commands more respect. Jamar Chase is not a guy that you need to double team because he's not creating separation off the ball or off the line of scrimmage too often. He creates his separation at the catch point. Big value to that. But Jalen Waddle's a guy where you have to use bracket coverage a lot of the time to take him out of the play. And even then, Jalen Waddle will run by your bracket coverage because he's so fast. And when you talk about a receiver that can command respect to the safety and sometimes multiple cornerbacks on one play, depending on the defensive assignment and coverage, Jalen Waddle just makes everything easier for everyone else on the field. And that elevates him for me. Tight end's a bit of a mess. I only have eight inside my top 200. And there's a big gap from number two in the entire draft for me and Kyle Pitts. And now number 76 in Pat Fryermuth all the way down the board. I like Fryermuth as a player. I don't think he's this crazy, amazing tight end prospect. He's just a solid receiver as at tight end. He's a, an okay blocker, nothing special. Brevin Jordan, I see, is like a Janu Smith type player, but he's not quite the athlete. So even though if Brevin Jordan could be a plus H back, in an offense there's only such a value to that so he's a little bit down the board Tommy Tremble I like long term Hunter Long is a big time tight end uh, in the red zone Kenny Yeboah I like is another big red zone guy that can just go up and get it Trey McKitty is outside of Kyle Pitts maybe the best athlete at tight end in the entire draft and then uh, Tony Poljohn is another guy who's just huge I think he's like 6'7 and he's another just red zone threat like Hunter Long can be I don't think it's a terrible tight end class. Like, I love McKitty and Yaboa down the board a little bit. I think Hunter Long's pretty good. I think Tommy Tremble's got big time potential. Brevin Jordan's extremely versatile. And then Pat Fryermuth is just an overall do it all solid tight end. Kyle Pitts is just different. I don't really have to wait on that for too long. I think the offensive tackle class is, is really, really good. Walker Little is probably the most interesting one because he was a super, super hyped up recruit that has been injured and we haven't seen him play football in a while, but apparently he's been training 
and he looks really, really good at his pro day. So Walker Little is a guy that could end up being a really good player in the NFL, but I just haven't seen it enough on tape and in college. So Walker Little is down the board a little bit for me, but I think higher than a lot of guys have him. I like Walker Little. I'm taking a chance on him, including him uh, at one or in the top 160. James Hudson, solid at Cincy. Stone Forsyth, I think he's solid as well. He's right next to Robert Hainsey. Jackson Carmen apparently has some personal stuff going on. Um, so you can really only take, what I think Brett said, the first four games of tape or so, uh, seriously, in 2020, which uh, make, make, makes sense. Makes sense. Jackson Carmen had some stretches where he looked really good and some stretches where he looked really bad. Alex Leatherwood is a guy that isn't super athletic and isn't the best tackle in the world, but I think he's solid. I think he's going to be an okay right tackle, could work into a starting role. Jalen Mayfield, another potential plug-and-play right tackle. I have him at 74. I just don't think he handles speed rushers all that well. And for a guy that doesn't have the longest arms in the world and isn't the most athletic in the world and can't really handle the speed guys, he looks solid. Didn't go up against the best competition. Kind of a weird one. I moved him down to 74. Brady Christensen and Dylan Radens. I do like these guys a lot. Brady Christensen's old. Had to move down. He's like 24, 25 from this BYU stuff. But I liked him on tape a lot. I think he is about a second round talent. Third round talent. Somewhere in that range. Really, really, really good athlete. But he is older. So how long will you get this guy playing at the top of his game? You know, what's the room on him developing? Because he is a really old draft player, really old prospect. Kind of tough to say. Raidens isn't the biggest tackle in the world, but is solid, but also didn't face the best competition. Spencer Brown is a monster. He's like 6'7", crazy good athlete, looked great at the Senior Bowl, wasn't facing the best competition at Northern Iowa. Moving up quite a lot, we got Sam Cosme. Just a guy that really didn't get beat too much at Texas. Really not at all. Amazing athlete. Not the meanest, not the best finisher in the world, but just an overall solid tackle. Liam Eichenberg's kind of the same way. Maybe not quite as good of an athlete as Sam Cosme is, but a little bit better fundamentally. And another guy that really didn't get beat at Notre Dame. Christian Darasaw, 27. Great athlete, apparently playing injured a lot at Virginia Tech. So maybe the injuries bring him down a little bit. But... Maybe you can argue that, hey, he was playing injured and still played at a really high level. So, Darisaw is a guy that is going to go a lot higher than 27, of course. But he's a guy that, you know, didn't always look the best on tape. Uh, He's crazy long, though. He's a prototypical size that teams covet at tackle. But to me, he was wishy-washy a little bit, so I moved him down. Tevin Jenkins, I love. uh, Best right tackle in the draft. Mean, mean, mean finisher. Really, really mauling right tackle. Decent in pass protection as well, but you love him as a run blocker more than anything. He's just a mean right tackle. Panay Sewell and then Rashawn Slater talked about a little bit inside the top 10 already. Interior offensive line was another tough position. As you can see, I do like some of these centers quite a lot. Drew Dahlman, Drake Jackson, Jimmy Morrissey. I think those guys are all going to be quality centers. Josh Myers as well to a degree. Aaron Banks and Kendrick Green I view as guards. Deontay Brown is a huge, huge mauling guard that didn't really look that good a lot. Um, I don't know. His best game was up there with some of the best guards in the entire class. His worst game, he looked undraftable. Deontay Brown was weird. I don't really know how to to grade him. So I have him just inside the top 100. He was a weird player. There's not really much else to say. He was up and down, wishy-washy. And he's not the most athletic guy, but he's just a tank. What is he listed at? 6'3", 364. He's a tank. Not much else to say about Deontay Brown. Quinn Miners. Quinn Miners was interesting. Uh, A lot of this is based off of how good he was at the Senior Bowl, where Quinn Miners just showed up and, on a lot of downs, just whooped some of the top defensive linemen who were seniors, of course, at the Senior Bowl. So there is a really, really big value to that. You're talking about a guy that's D3 Wisconsin Whitewater that looked really good against D1 talent. So, yeah, kind of a weird projection, but we're talking about a guy that looks the part, has all the potential in the world, really good athlete for the position, 
I think he could be a quality starting center or guard in the NFL within a few years. Trey Smith, another guy I'm higher on than a lot of other uh, analysts I see. Trey Smith is a great athlete, really big, really strong, really powerful, and technically sound. His health issues, I think, have people lower on him, but he played tackle and played tackle at a high level early on in Tennessee, came to Tennessee as a tackle. And when I was watching Trey Smith, I went back to his tackle tape to see if this is a guy that can play tackle. And I think, yeah, even though he's an interior offensive lineman, I think Trey Smith doesn't have to be stuck on the interior if you don't need him to. I think he's a guy that can play tackle in a pinch if you need one. I think he can be a plus starting left guard in the NFL. I like Trey Smith a lot. Wyatt Davis, one of the best guards in the draft. Um, Elijah Vera Tucker, I think, is up a lot higher because of his versatility as a guy that can potentially play uh, center, or excuse me, tackle, geez, and um, he's above some of these centers in Landon Dickerson and Creed Humphrey. Wyatt Davis is just solid. I think he's gonna, he's a guy that's going to go on day two, and I think a team's going to be fairly happy. He's plug-and-play guard for sure. Uh, can play left or right guard, in my opinion, depending on the offensive side. I think maybe you trust Wyatt Davis enough, you got a right-handed quarterback, plug him in at right guard, and then you're running to the offensive right a lot. I think that's just, you know, the way the quarterback opens up. You want your right guard to be big, strong, powerful. Wyatt Davis checks the boxes. Creed Humphrey and Landon Dickerson are close. They are close. Landon Dickerson is the best interior offensive lineman on tape. I, I'll say it, and I think considerably so. He is big, strong, powerful, mauler, team leader. You love everything about Landon Dickerson. Fundamentally sound. I think even though he's a center, could play guard and be a really, really good guard. Landon Dickerson has big time injury concerns. Misses a lot of games, has missed a lot of games, tours ACL, and that's, you know, the most recent big time injury, but he's been injured before. So he drops for me. Still definitely a first round talent, but Landon Dickerson's injuries move him down the board. Creed Humphrey, wrestling background, Great idea for leverage, fundamentally sound, really, really smart player, has a really good idea of where his help needs to be if he doesn't have to block anyone over the nose. So Creed Humphrey, really smart, really good, not the biggest center in the world, brings him down a little bit, but I think he's near a first round talent. Creed Humphrey's really good. And then AVT at 16, we talked about him potentially playing tackle. I think he can do it. I think he's immediately a really, really good guard. So... Vera Tucker for me is just the best overall offensive uh, interior or interior offensive lineman in the class because you don't really have to worry about the injury concerns. You know he's a good athlete. You know he has a size. You know he's a technical ability and potentially the versatility to move over and play tackle as well. Kind of checks all the boxes to make him a top 20 player in the draft for me and the best interior offensive lineman. IDL. I'm going to be unapologetic with this. No one has Marvin Wilson as a top defensive tackle in the class. I do. I don't care. Marvin Wilson in 2018 and 2019 was an absolute stud. Absolute stud. He can play nose. He can play the three technique. And you talk about a guy that can play 0-1 and three technique. Marvin Wilson is the guy. Can two gap on the interior defensive line. That you know, holding two gaps can shoot to either. I think he offers pass rush on the interior as well. Marvin Wilson did not have a great 2020. He was playing the five tech, moved over to the seven. He was on the edge. Marvin Wilson was playing all over in weird three-man fronts and just wasn't as effective in those roles. Played with a torn meniscus. I don't care about 2020. I don't. I saw what I saw in 2019. He was a top player for me going into the 2020 season. Didn't show it for you know, reasons X, Y, and Z. But based off of what I saw, and I went back, watched 2019 again, watched 2018 again. I love Marvin Wilson. In a weaker D-line class, or at least on the interior, he is DT1 for me. Christian Barmore, man, he is weird. Doesn't play a whole lot. Going back and watching him was odd, man. He was not in the game as much as you'd like to see from the consensus DT1 in the class. But Barmore... Doesn't offer a lot as a run stopper, so he just wasn't in on traditional running downs. As a pass rusher, Barmore is legit. Christian Barmore is a legit pass rush prowess type player where he can get after the quarterback. He turned it up down the stretch, 
And I think he could be a plus player in the league. He's, he's one of these boomer bust guys that could be great, could maybe be not so good. And when do you play him? How often? Does he rotate in? Is he a guy that can defend the run at the next level? A lot of unanswered questions. So he's down a little bit. Davion Nixon had a big breakout season as Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year. It's showing up on tape clearly. He's a guy that's a problem. We talk about interior penetrators, another guy that can really get after the QB. Really, really strong hands, good feel of leverage. I like Davion Nixon a lot. Leve Anzarike, he seems to be either DT1 or DT2 for a lot of guys. I don't know. He just didn't have the production for me at all, and just didn't really seem to get after it enough. He's a guy that opted out of 2020. Kind of a mixed bag. I feel like if you're going to have him as DT1 or 2, how do you not have Marvin Wilson higher? So I have him a little bit lower. But these guys are all fairly close. Aleem McNeil, I like a ton. He is a nose tackle. And there is a value to that. He's maybe the best nose tackle in the entire draft. He's not going to offer you a ton as a pass rusher. At least he didn't at NC State, even though he's a guy that moves pretty well. I like Aleem McNeil. I just don't... I don't rank nose tackles that high because they're nose tackles. I don't think they're do-it-all players at the position. And I like guys with total upside, especially pass rush upside, because it's harder to find that. And there are a bunch of big nose tackles you can stick, you know, over the center and do the job pretty well. It's it's easier to find that. And Ali McNeil's a stud, don't get me wrong. Could have pass rush potential because of his athleticism. I don't think 78 is too low. DT5 is the right spot for me. Milton Williams played a lot of edge at Louisiana Tech. I see him as an inside guy. I think he's going to play 5 Tech uh, in a 3-4, 3-4 defensive end. Really, really, really amazing athlete. Good feel for leverage. Powerful hands as well. I like Milton Williams a lot. Osa Adigazua is not quite the athlete. Not the biggest guy in the world. High motor, high effort type pass rusher. I like Osa Adigazua a lot. Uh, Kyrus Tonga. One of these big Samoan guys that gets after it. Or Samoan, you know, Pacific Islander. I'm not sure exactly what he is. But he's big, and he moves really well. He's listed at 6'4", 322. Kairos Tonga is one of these guys, like Tommy Togiai and like Jay Tufele, that are big and can move. And Kairos Tonga flashes on tape. You watch the BYU defense. This guy explodes off the ball sometimes and makes these big-time plays. Marlon Tui uh, Pulotu, another guy, I kind of like him. I have him graded fairly similarly. Maybe a better run defender. Same thing with Tommy Togiai. Tyler Shelvin is a typical nose. J2 Fele, I think, is a nose as well. People will tell you you can get after the quarterback. I don't see it as much. Another opt-out. Tu Fele could be a really good player. I have my top 150. I don't really see it yet. I, I'd love to see him develop, but it just wasn't there for me in 2019 on tape. Taquan Graham out of Texas. Watched him play a ton over the years. Taquan Graham is a guy I do like a lot. I don't know if there's Texas bias in there, but I like Taquan Graham as a player. Bobby Brown, great athlete at D-tackle. He's a guy that can really move. He's built like, I, I want to just say a brick shithouse, 6'4", 315, and he can move. Uh, it's, that's so funny. Open that up. Built like a brick house. That's about brick shithouse is what you mean. Um, he's a guy that is just absolutely massive and is a stonewaller. Really, really great athlete. Jalen Twyman is a guy that people seem to be high on. They think he's the next Aaron Donald. I don't see it. Uh, he's not really great with his hands. They're not powerful. He's not a great athlete. Twyman's an okay player. 2020 uh, opt-out, I believe. I don't know. I just didn't really see it. Darius Stills I like. I think he's a pretty good athlete. A guy that you might want to take a shot at early day three. To Daryl Slayton, another big-time nose. There is a value to it. He's my last player in my top 200. I don't think he's crazy good. I think he's just a nose tackle. Offers no pass rush at all. Edge is a very, very, very deep class. I feel like it's been underrated the entire year just because we don't really have that, you know, Nick Bosa or Joey Bosa or Chase Young type player. I think Jalen Phillips can be in that same league. I think he's a complete package off the edge. I love Jalen Phillips. He has the best pass rushing ability of any edge in the class probably any player in the class and i don't think it's particularly close if we scroll down here i've ranked a lot of different edge guys two duke guys i think are fairly close both similar in play rump just isn't that big but these guys are high effort guys that are like finesse rushers that 
can get after the quarterback. Joshua Kando was tough. I wanted to include him on my top 200 because I, I think he's a guy that can end up being either a priority free agent for a team or even go a lot earlier because of his athletic ability. He's a guy that flashed sometimes, super highly recruited. I didn't love watching him in 2020. He's a guy in 2019 that looked a little bit better in 2018, was a little bit better. So Kando, great athlete that we just didn't really see it last year. I think he could be really good long term. Kind of weird though. I have him, you know, all the way down at the bottom. Um, who else can I, I really talk about at depth that you guys might be interested in? Malcolm Koontz was a guy interesting to watch at Buffalo. You know, he's no Khalil Mack coming out of Buffalo, but good athlete with pass rush upside. Jordan Smith is an interesting one as well. I have him really close to Malcolm Koontz, where he's going to be a 3 4 outside linebacker. He's like 6 7. Didn't test particularly well, but plays really fast. I don't know if it's because he added weight to his pro day, because he was a guy that looked really, really lanky and really thin on tape. Can't set the edge. That's not his game. He's a 3 4 outside linebacker with pass rush upside and pass rush downs. He's really, really freaky athletic off the edge with no plan and no ability to use his hands as a rusher. Was decent at the Senior Bowl. So what player are you getting? I just don't know yet. Another interesting one is Cameron Sample. Cam Sample is listed at edge on the draft network. I don't view him as an edge. I view him as an interior defensive lineman. I think he's also a five tech in the same way we talked about um who's a five tech milton williams as a five tech so if you see where i have cam sample on my big board at 83 and then compare him to idl i think he's right behind milton williams i think they're similar players i think they're gonna play similar roles williams is the better athlete sample maybe better technically but they're very very close and i have cam sample sliding in there right at 83 but back to edge it's a strong edge class I have Rousseau at 75. I don't think Gregory Rousseau is this good player. I, I don't. I, I know Daniel Jeremiah has him super high. I know a lot of guys have him super high. I made a video about Rousseau months ago saying I was really disappointed when I watched him because I was. I thought he was going to be this stud, and he just wasn't to me. And I don't think he has this crazy upside. If you're talking about you know, putting 30 or so pounds on a guy for him to be usable, what are we talking about? So, Rousseau is a huge question mark. He's not this great athlete. I don't know what people see in Gregory Rousseau. I can't even say his name. Gregory is it Rousseau is a tough name for me to say back to back. Gregory Rousseau. I don't know, man. Like, wh- what do you have best case scenario? A guy that can set the edge pretty well and then on big time pass rush downs rotate to the inside? He's a weird player. Roche was a big senior bowl riser. Same with Basham for me, where these guys were not the best on tape, but decent. Flashed on tape, but then came and really played well at the senior bowl. So I have them higher because it, it's showing to me that they, they can grow and, and do well in one-on-one situations. Osai is a guy who is an edge, but I think he's a guy that can not only play 3-4 outside linebacker, but 4-3 outside linebacker, especially in attacking 4-3. He doesn't have to play exclusively on the edge. I think he has the ability to drop back and do both. There are just some really talented edge players in the class. Peyton Turner is a classic 4-3 edge. Ronnie Perkins could play 3-4 outside linebacker. That might be his perfect role, actually. He's not a super big edge, so... 4-3 4-3 defensive end could be a little bit of a tough task, but he's a really good run defender, so it's workable. Joe Tryon is a guy that a lot of NFL teams seem to love, and it's understandable why. We'd love to see him finish more, but he flashes great hand usage as well. Aziz Ojolari isn't the bendiest edge in the world, but high motor, uh, good hands at times, can get around the edge, but you, you see a little bit of tightness in the hips, the knees, the ankles that limits his bendiness as a player overall. I do like him, though. Quiddy Pay is a player I think is going to be really, really good in three to four years when he can develop those hands as a pass rusher. But he's a really technical run defender. So there's a lot to like with Quiddy Pay as like a 4-3 defensive end long term. I think he's athletic enough to play 3-4 outside linebacker. It's just about hand usage as a rusher to make him an actual well-rounded defensive end or edge guy. Jalen Phillips, we talked about. I think he's just a stud overall. Pretty deep linebacker class as well. 
There are a couple guys at the end here. Like Charles Snowden, I view as an edge guy as well. We talked about him. I talked about him in my sleepers video. I like Charles Snowden. He's the guy that I think, like people think Rousseau is, crazy athlete with big time upside. He's an actual big, long, lanky athlete. I don't think Rousseau is the athlete that Snowden is. Chaz Surratt is a good inside backer. Dylan Moses, something was wrong with him. He was coming off an ACL and he just didn't look the same. And I think another injury as well. But like 2018 Dylan Moses is a really, really good player. So Dylan Moses drops because of injury and bad play most recently. But I think Dylan Moses could be very good. Pete Warner's like a hybrid safety. I have him a little bit above Baron Browning. I think he's just, he was a better player on tape, even though Baron Browning's this all-world athlete. Nick Bolton doesn't miss tackles. There is a value to that. Really, really fast as well. Not really a cover guy. Jabril Cox is not the athlete that Nick Bolton is. Isn't the strong wrap-up tackler that Nick Bolton is, but is really, really good in coverage. There is a value to that. Cameron McGrone was injured and didn't really play in 2020 uh, to the level that we've seen in the past. 2019 Cam McGrone is a really, really good player. Has a decent feel for coverage. Great athlete. Can be your day one Mike linebacker. Has the instincts. Has the tackling ability. Can blow up uh, even offensive linemen in the run. So, Cam McGrone, I love. I needed him in my top 50. Ended up being in the top 40. Jamin Davis at 33. I think he's a similar player to Cam McGrone, honestly. He has a little bit of a better feel for coverage. And he's a guy who recently was better than Cam McGrone was and doesn't have the injury stuff. Saban Collins is a massive outside linebacker. Pass rush capability. Really good in coverage for a guy that's 6'5", 270. Just or 6'4", 270. He's ridiculously big, but moves like a guy a lot smaller. Micah Parsons, I have a 21. I don't think guys are going to like that. They view Micah Parsons as a top 10 player in the class because he's a great athlete. And Micah Parsons is a great athlete. Day one, I got big questions. He has almost no feel for zone coverage at all. Hasn't had to do it. And when he was tasked with you know zone responsibilities at Penn State which wasn't super often he was really bad he's athletic enough to play man with anybody because he's just again a stud athlete and he's good as a blitzer as an inside linebacker but I don't think he's instinctive enough to know where he needs to be a lot of the time he's good at getting to his landmarks because he's really fast but sometimes he won't get to them because he just doesn't know where he has to be so sometimes he misses getting in the proper run fit. Sometimes he gets misdirected. So Micah Parsons could be this great all-world player in three, four, five years. But I don't know how good he's going to be right away. It depends on what team he goes to. Because depending on his responsibilities, he could either look really bad or really great. Huge upside, boomer bust potential in my opinion. And then JOK. He's a hybrid safety. He's an overhang defender. He's great in coverage, zone, and man. Can play man coverage with wide receivers. So there's an extreme value to that. Can come up and make plays in the run. He's not a Mike linebacker. This is a, a will, in my opinion. He's going to play weak side or you know in that overhang role. Maybe use him as like a box safety. He's going to be in the box. He's going to be in the slot or in the overhang role. Kind of the same thing. I really like him as a player. Not a great run defender like some of these other linebackers are, but the best cover linebacker in the draft. Get to cornerback, deep cornerback class as well. Some of these guys I like better at safety, like Elijah Molden, a slot corner uh, slash safety. It depends on what you want, because there are some really good zone corners in the class. I've got a lot of uh, corners. I think there are a lot of good corners. Sean Wade had to move down a lot. He's just not very good, honestly. To you know, compared to what I originally thought he could have been based on the hype. Marco Wilson, great athlete, got exposed a lot at Florida. If you can coach him up, you could get a really good player because he's just such a freak athlete. Mukwamu's huge. Robert Rochelle went to Central Arkansas, but his tape looked really good. It's just about how can he handle these bigger receivers. I love Ambry Thomas a lot. I think he's going to be a good late round guy. Benjamin St. Juice, he's going to go earlier. But I, I think he's solid as well. Keith Taylor as a boundary man corner. I love Keith Taylor. He just can't play the nickel. He can't tackle. I don't really care as much on the boundary. Adebo is one of the better zone corners in the class. Of course, talked about Tay Gowan, Aaron Robinson. I like those guys at UCF. Tyson Campbell, a lot of guys are really high on him. I think he's good. I don't think he's great. So I made a, a slight adjustment to this earlier. I was looking at a slightly old version 
So numbers might be off by one or two, but mostly things are staying the same. Uh, we talked about Tay Gowan and Aaron Robinson a lot on this channel. Tyson Campbell seems like, again, a lot of guys are super high on him. I think Tyson Campbell's a great athlete. I'm still kind of waiting to see some of that technical ability from him. Elijah Molden is, you know, a slot cornerback who I think would be pretty good. We talked about him. Really, really good tackler. Not the best athlete in the world. Pretty good view for zone coverage. Ife Yatumelafanu could be a guy that goes first round. Again, it's tough because there are a lot of really good players in this class. I wouldn't mind Melifanu at like 40, but there are just so many good players where it's tough to rank these guys. Kelvin Joseph, one of the better zone corners in the class, punched the coach, moved down a little bit, but he definitely is very good. Asante Samuel Jr., a little bit of size concerns with him, but I think he plays bigger. I'm not really ultra worried about any of that. I like Asante Samuel Jr., especially in off-man coverage. Eric Stokes, I'm very high on him still. Great athlete. The technical ability needs some work, but I think he can hang in man coverage with anybody, press or off-man. Maybe not the best zone cover corner in the world. Didn't really have to do it a ton at Georgia, but I think that if you go, you know, if you're a man-heavy team, let's say, and you want to pick a guy like Eric Stokes, he's going to fit right in and be great. Uh, you know, day one, work up in his starting role somewhere across the course of the year. Caleb Farley, big time back injuries. Tours ACL in 2017. Big injury concerns. And you can come back from an ACL a lot easier than maybe a nagging back injury for the rest of your career. Here's a big question mark. So Greg Newsom pushed up a little bit over Caleb Farley just because the tape was fairly similar, honestly. I think Farley is a little bit better on tape. These top four cornerbacks are really close. And then I think Stokes is the clear five for me. And then, you know, obviously a lot of these other guys are pretty close as well. J.C. Horn and Patrick Sertan are very, very, very close. Sertan is better now. J.C. Horn could be better in two or three years. We're talking about the floor guy versus the ceiling guy. J.C. Horn, if he can stop grabbing, is going to be a stud. Patrick Sertan is really good now. He's not the craziest athlete in the world but he's just really solid. And then last but not least, we got safety. I love the safety class. I love the safety class. Trayvon Merrick is probably the best. I have him fairly close to Javon Holland. They're both fairly versatile. I think Javon Holland can play over the top a little bit better than Trayvon Merrick, who can just kind of do everything. Richie Grant, I also think, is a stud. Another do-it-all guy at the Senior Bowl. Show that he can play man coverage with anybody. Andre Sisco was a guy I went back and forth on for a while. But he's a really, really good athlete. I think he can play single high over the top as well. Real ball hawk. The production kind of speaks for itself. Jamar Johnson isn't the biggest or the best athlete, but he has an extreme nose for the football. He finds, he locates, he makes plays. Big value to that at safety. That's what you look for. Versatile guy that can play in the box, near the line of scrimmage. Over the top is a little bit more of a question mark because of his long speed. Overall, though, I love Jamar Johnson. Tyree Gillespie, I think, is underrated. He's really good. Our Darius Washington, another like small guy, not the best athlete, but great instincts, great feel for zone coverage. I like our Darius Washington. Had to move him down. He's just not the best athlete. Divine Diablo, better athlete. Big time, big time safety. Big, big guy. But I don't think he's as instinctive as like an Ardarius Washington. Hampson Nasiro leans like a hybrid linebacker. Richard LeCount tested really bad. But I think he plays way, way, way faster on tape. Caden Stearns could have been so good. Dude, after his freshman year at Texas, I thought he was going to be special. And then injury after injury after injury. The two Cincy safeties are back-to-back. Forrest is a better athlete. Wiggins, I think, is the more instinctive, better feel for coverage safety, more technical safety. I don't know. Kind of weird. Um, but it's like, do you prefer the athlete or the guy that's better right now? And overall... I lean towards the guy that's better right now versus the better athlete in most scenarios. But overall, this is my big board. We're going to scroll down here just so we can see every name where everybody falls in the draft. This is how I feel about it. I know many are going to disagree. It's tough to get a, uh, a big board very similar with everybody else. I'm just, I just don't feel how everyone else feels. I feel how I feel. So if you have any questions, be sure to leave them down in the comments section below. I'd be happy to uh, glance at them and not respond. 
No, I'm just kidding. But I, I can't get to everybody. I'm going to get like, you know, hundreds of comments on this video. So I, maybe I'll get to a few. I'm always on Twitter. Follow me on Twitter, twitter.com slash Bengal YouTube. Link is in the chat. This was a long video, but I ranked a lot of guys. I ranked 200 guys this year. And it was not easy. It took me hundreds of hours of watching these guys. But I feel fairly confident some of the guys who are not on this list are going to end up being studs. Some of the guys at the top of this list are going to end up doing nothing. But based off of what I saw on tape and how I feel about the players individually, this is where I have things. So that's my big board for 2021. So many hundreds of hours finally culminating to this ranking. <laughs> so I appreciate you guys watching. Hit that subscribe button if you're not subscribed already. And I'll see you in the next one. Take it easy. See me high step to the end zone. My life like a game Nintendo. Playing with the best, let them know. Get off the track, the train's coming through. Yeah. Promise you get in my way, then you best believe I'ma just run over you. Yeah, yeah. I'ma turn taking it back to the house. Defense a joke, I'm laughing so loud. Speed burst good.